Hello there. Hi, I think it was Philip mentioned earlier, sorry if I've got it wrong. It's actually a technological question. You were saying that ECGs, sorry, EEGs, are as good as the technology you'll find in a hospital. And if you go back to, oh, this is 30 years ago. Just talk on mic if you sorry. can. Sorry. Yeah, start, start I had, again I if you can. I did have an EEG 30 years ago, so to make it straightforward, it was for epilepsy. And mm. they detect nothing, but I was having lots of seizures, and they said, oh, it's reliable as nothing. It's just as, <coughs> we just do them in case we see them occasionally. So I'd really yep. like to know, has the technology massively changed, or it is still as unreliable as it used to mm. be? Well, the, the technology hasn't changed at all in terms of the hardware, the tools that are used to pick up the signal. It's actually quite simple, simple technology. It's essentially a disk that conducts an electrical signal and, and, and wires. What's probably improved uh, is that the software and the analysis routines used to e extract meaning from the signal. Um, and, and so a raw signal picked up from the brain, nobody can make any sense out of. Uh, perhaps it can tell you how awake or a, a, a literally asleep or anaesthetised someone is. Although not according to our device <laughs> over right. here. That's right. <laughs> In fact, I think you're still... Oh, no, it's not on no. your head. It's not on his head. It's cool. No difference. How bizarre. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the raw signal doesn't have a lot of meaning that we can extract. So it's all in the analysis that's done after it's collected where the meaning is actually extracted. Uh, and so the software tools that have been used, um, the software routines that, that extract that meaning have probably developed a lot over the years. Um, so would they, would, could you still make a mistake? I guess so, you know, because there are a lot of uh, variables um, in the mix when you're looking at an EEG signal, uh, and, and I'm sure, and obviously it depends upon the kind of issue that we're talking about. Some signals leap out and, and grab you, and they're very obvious. When someone blinks their eyes, there's an enormous change in the EEG. But you want to subtract that out, Exactly. Don't you? you want to remove that. But the, the more complex the thinking goes, if you're trying to extract a signal that's linked with decision-making, for example, well, it becomes more and more difficult to accurately extract that signal. And I think we've still actually got quite a fair way to go. Any more questions? Oh, yes, lots. OK, where are we? Uh, We're coming over here. Thank you. I'm interested in how you actually recruit for your focus groups because if people are sort of opting in to be part of that focus group, could an argument be made that there's a sort of bias there and therefore are you able to generalise back to the general population, if that makes sense? I can take that one yeah. if, if you want. Sure. Uh, oh, Shane. We, we use uh, a, a number of ways to recruit people, and particularly, well, again, based on the objectives of the study. So it can sometimes be a very broad sample that we're looking for, so just a, a random sample of anyone from 20 up to 50, uh, or it can be very, very narrow. It could be someone in the 25 to 30-year-old category they're the main grocery buyer in the house. They will only buy um, Arnott's biscuits. It, it really just depends on the actual study. That do you pay them? And yes, we do pay our participants, yes. And the, the recruitment companies have vast, vast databases of people who, who want to participate in, in market research. I guess what I'm getting at is there's obviously an eagerness there to participate. So are you really capturing everyone's thinking process? Does that make sense? Yeah, I do understand what you're saying. And, and I think from, from a research perspective and, and getting a reliable sample, which is generalizable to the, the broader community, you know, it's a, and I always bug my statistician friends, it's, you know, it's a manipulation of the numbers, so to speak, to make sure that you're getting a, a reliable and valid sample. Because ultimately, if we, we want to, to work out the, the fundamental rules behind sampling, we're all our own individual segment. Um, but from a research perspective, that's not um, necessarily the most economical way to go and, and realistic way to go. So we, we manage that by ensuring that we get a as unbiased sample as, as we can. And from an EEG perspective, I think it's important to, to recognise, and I have to tell my clients this all the time, they say, well, can we just do one participant? Mm. Ah. <laughs> and, and I say, well, you could. You're not going to get any information out of that, but you know, I'm happy for you to, to collect that sort of data because from an EEG perspective, 
uh, we're actually grouping those EEG recordings together. So we're not actually looking at one individual response. We have to average those responses together because, as Phil said, they're such small signals, we actually have to average them together mm. to actually identify anything meaningful. Well, no brain scan is really ever one brain. It's usually right. a collation of many brains, isn't it? Another question. I think we had, did we have one, we have one just over here? Great. Back, and I'll get the one in the middle, I think it was. And upstairs too, we've got Kieran there standing very patiently for you. <laughs> I'll try to be quick. Um, Phil and Shane, thank you both for clarifying what the role of neuromarketing at the moment is. It's, it's ascertaining what people want, not telling them what they want. Mm -hmm. I find from a public policy perspective, the interest in the, in the ethical perspective, and Peter, you might wish to comment on this, how this technology and this practice applies to broader questions, and I'm thinking about the obesity problem that we have in the Western world, mm. and we already know that many companies are very sophisticated in marketing, manufactured food to people, who, and, and this, this technology and how it could be applied in an already troubling, some people might say, area of marketing. So it goes to your point, Phil, about maybe we're talking about marketing more broadly, mm. but the ethics question for me comes with the intersection of this technology. Yep. And I've practice. got a response, perhaps one thing I'd like to say. Phil, did, just to check, did you hear that, Phil? Peter? Uh, Peter, I mean, sorry. I did, you yeah. Did. Good, just checking. Phil? I'll, I'll just jump in because some of my research actually d d directly connects with some of those points. So in our research, for example, one of the tasks that we're interested in is this choice between an impulsive decision versus self-control. Self and we play that off in this task, asking people, do you want money now or more money later on? And it pits those two forces against each other. And it's exactly that kind of interplay between impulsivity and self-control, which plays into the obesity issue, um, all manner of issues of addiction, for example. And, and what we hope to do is use imaging techniques to better understand those forces, literally at the neural level, to help us literally break down that, that mechanism of decision making so we can understand it better and do something about it. Yeah. Peter, you might have a comment there. I know you've just written a really interesting paper on, on addiction and neuroscience. Yeah, so I think that I, I actually this is one area where work in the general field that gets uh, called neuromarketing, but is really the neuroscience of decision making um, is um, is on the it certainly has the potential to be um, a real boon to society at, at large because it believe it or not, uh, many of the decisions we make are are not very good decisions. Um, and a lot of the in fact, a lot of the no, health issues not. that we have. <laughs> uh, obesity being the most obvious one, addiction being an, an, another uh, issue, addiction writ large, if you will, um, are ones that we bring upon ourselves by making poor decisions. And um, we make them because of the environment in which we live, which um, biases us towards those decisions. And as we further our understanding of the neural underpinnings of decision making and all the different factors that go into it, which certainly the neuromarketers want to understand, we also have the opportunity to actually help people make better decisions. And there's a couple of ways of thinking about this. Probably the most famous one right now is um, this issue. This, uh, there's a book called Nudge. Uh, I don't know whether that, that has been uh, marketed heavily down in Australia, but it's certainly been very popular in um, North America, and it's this notion of choice architecture that sometimes just the way that choices are presented to us lead us to make one choice versus another. Mm. And they um, coined this term of um, a, a form of, well, I, I won't get into it too much, but a form of soft paternalism where they try to set up the decision making architecture such that people tend to make the better decision rather than the worst decision. And as we understand how these processes go, I think we'll be in a better position to actually be able to help people, which would be a great thing. Yes, you could really see some of these neuromarketing principles being employed to target public health campaigns. Yeah, and definitely. so there's actually a, a whole interesting flip side that is nothing to do with commercial realities, mm -hmm. isn't there? Mm -hmm. Another question. Yes, we're making Brian work tonight. <laughs> we need to have you on a hoist. <laughs> Thank you. I was interested in something that Phil said early on 
about um, when people suffer particular types of brain damage that kind of knock out the emotional component in decision making and that they actually make worse decisions. Mm. And I'm, I was just interested to hear more about that, whether it's understood why and, and in what direction those decisions are worse because that mm. emotional component is obviously an area in which we're particularly vulnerable to potential manipulation. Mm. Sure. So um, <coughs> Peter, Peter's alluded to this to a certain extent. So there are some areas in the brain, up in the extreme frontal areas of the brain, which appear to help us learn from our experience. Um, when we experience a certain um, scenario or a certain um, series of events, the emotional response that we have when we encounter those events gets linked with that memory. And these, this region of the brain actually brings those emotional memories back the next time we encounter a similar set of events. And so when we lose the ability to bring that emotional colour into our decision making, we lose the benefit of our experience. So the emotional response we had last time around gets, gets lost and so we can tend to repeat the same mistakes repeatedly. Uh, and there's a classic case study that every neuroscience student learns in first year neuroscience about a, a guy called Phineas Gage back in the 1800s and he was a railway worker who actually uh, was charged with tamping down the, ex the explosives with a, a very long metal spike, about six foot long or so. And the explosion went off and drove the spike through his eyeball, up through the front of his brain and out the other side. And the heat of the explosion actually cauterised the wound. And so he lived. He had a hole through the front part of his brain and a hole out the top, but he lived. And he had a bit of a personality change, he, though, didn't he? Had he had an extreme personality change. Yeah. And this is the point that Phineas Gage uh, and his doctor w uh, noted his recovery and quite extensive notes about, about this case study. And Phineas's IQ didn't change. Mm. So his ability to make, uh, to bring um, cognitive processing to bear in his decision making was fully intact. But he lost the ability to bring the emotional colouring to his decisions, and, and his life gradually fell apart. As you can imagine. As you can imagine. You don't get a steel rod through the head every day, do you? <laughs> um, and we have one in the middle here. Oh, one just here. Oh, over here. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Brian. Thank you. Two in the middle. I'm talking to Peter in Canada. Uh, Peter mentioned uh, self-regulation. I don't think it'll work. Uh, who's, we haven't got a code of ethics or a code of practice or anything like that yet. Uh, I think that this industry is developing faster than anybody's bothering to get a code of ethics into place so that if self-regulation did work, they'd have something to work with. Uh, once upon a time in South Australia, we had prescriptive legislation in the health and safety field, 1995, that was abolished and the duty of care was placed on the owners and employers. It hasn't worked very well. Mm. And this industry is developing quicker than we can get standards and other things mm. to do it. It's not just this industry, there's a lot of industry that regulators can't keep up with. What Thank you. That's what's the panel got to say about yeah. that? I, I perhaps I could make one comment. Uh, I believe today or tomorrow at the Advertising Research Foundation conference in New York, there's been a um, a report being released, which is the industry, if we can call it that, it's not really an industry yet, fledgling industries attempts to set up some standards. Um, and so that report, I think, is literally being launched as, as we speak. So there is some attempt being made by the industry to come up with some standards. We don't know what, what that report says yet, but I think And whether it'll cover all jurisdictions. Exactly. Yeah. But there is so at least some attempt being made to self-regulate, yeah. Peter. It, yeah, if I could could comment, I, I, I have to agree with the, with the questioner that uh, self-regulation is problematic and I, I don't think anybody has to look very much further than the 2008 financial crisis to see um, how self-regulation can uh, end up um, resulting in outcomes that are less than desirable. But really what we're calling for by suggesting that there should be some self-regulation by industry is a step forward from where we are now. And, um, you know, it, 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 right now it, it's really wide open in terms of each individual firm has the opportunity to pursue whatever uh, path it decide, 
decides to pursue all on its own. So if they begin to self-regulate, that's probably in their best interest because eventually there'll be some problem and some blow up and then there'll be external regulation. Mm -hmm. The other thing is that, you know, uh, as neuroethicists, we like to mention often that, we're, you know, we're not the police. We don't really like to take the role of, of the police. So it's not so much that we want to say no, but what we want to do is we want to just point out some issues that um, society needs to pay attention to um, that are relevant to society with advances in the neurosciences and then allow uh, various uh, processes to come to play on bringing them into alignment with society's goals. Mm. Okay, we've got just a few more minutes left and I think what I'll do is we'll whip around and get a few questions in a row um, and then we'll get the panel to respond to them, shall we? So we can get as much in as we can in the last five minutes. So sure. I um, just had uh, one online question. We're getting this whole thing live streamed oh, at the moment. Um, so during Shane's presentation, uh, a user by the name of Veg uh, <laughs> asked... Hi, I Veg. Wonder, <laughs> hi, Veg. <laughs> I wonder if deep subconscious memory comes into play in neuromarketing. Okay, we'll hold that one. Next question. Can you, can you remember them? Um, just in the context of this series, uh, i.e. the seven deadly sins, this is uh, with regards to envy. Um, surely there is an element of that and the bypassing of the conscious thought of I, I, I want that product, I don't want that product. When you look at things like celebrity endorsements, surely that is a, an overt manipulation of people to mm. say, you buy this, you, you'll, you'll, you'll gain the same qualities I have, mm. whoever that is on the page. Mm. Mm. Okay. Hold that thought. Yeah. Um, and have we got another one? We'll do it in threes. Yes? No? We'll cover those two and we'll come back. So, um, deep subconscious memory, does that come into play from Veg Online? Well, I think it, that goes to sort of what, what Phil was, was talking about in terms of understanding how experience comes into play with our, our emotional decision. You've got to understand, and as, as Phil rightly pointed out, EEG is recording activity on the outer part of the, the brain. Some of those areas are linked to, to some memory, but when we're looking at deep subconscious memory, we're talking about the hippocampus, which is a structure deep within the brain, um, and an EEG does not necessarily record um, the theta activity um, that the hippocampus responds. MRI, different story. You, you and even the concept that. of a sub deep subconscious That's memory right. is a little bit woolly, I have to say. Abs I mean, absolutely. Long term and memories are stored in the exterior uh, surfaces that, that, of the brain. That's so right. Whatever in terms that means. Of, of what's more important is actually trying to get an understanding of what the experience is for consumers and, and ensuring that the companies are still continuing to offer that experience for, for that individual. And our question in the middle about the celebrity endorsement and overt marketing. Uh, I'll respond to that one as well, because my sister company in the US has actually done research with celebrity endorsements to, to identify whether or not they actually work. They drive me nuts. And m it goes to the whole sponsorship type market research area as well, which in, in my opinion is not particularly good. Um, but the, the research that um, SANS research conducted overseas clearly showed that celebrity endorsements don't actually work and, and, and that there was no benefit to the actual products being endorsed by the, by the mm. individuals. Mm. So those 60 minute, actually 60 minute ads overnight, <laughs> those infotainment <laughs> ads with celebrities, That's right. with perfect skin, mm. you know. The interesting thing is with envy, um, it, it, it typically needs to be with against a similar other. We, you know, we, we don't tend to envy people who are in a different class, or maybe we do envy people who are in a different class, but, but yeah. envy is very much linked with, yeah, someone I can compare to myself but has more than I do. And, and in my limited poking around looking for neuroimaging studies that looked at envy in mm. preparation for tonight, I saw that there's essentially two brain regions that fire, and one is this reward system, when we see someone that has something that we're envious of, and the other, and, and this is doing a lot of what we call reverse inference, Mm. Um, but another region of the brain called the anterior cingulate, which tends to fire when there's a conflict, then there's a problem that needs resolving or some kind of conflict. Um, that fires as well, apparently, in, in, in envy states. So we're seeing a reward and there's some kind of conflict between perhaps you know, what we think we should have and what someone else has. 
but we've got to be careful of those kinds of interpretations. Yes, indeed. Yeah. A final question? Yes, uh, thanks. Oh, Peter. Can I, can I just make one quick comment on, on that? That That's kind of an, an interesting aspect of how reward is now understood, is that it's not so much that an item is rewarding in and of itself, but that um, the, the modern view of it is that it has to do with what our expectation is. So if you're expecting something to be rewarding and then it falls short, that's very much more disappointing than had you not been expecting it um, in, in the first place. I and mean, in the same sort of way, something that is a surprise reward is much, much more rewarding than the same sort of, of reward when you're expecting it uh, to be there. And so uh, the celebrity endorsements, of course, what they, I, I think, where they, the way that they w work to the extent that they work is that they change our expectations. And actually, I think the reason that they don't work is because we're disappointed when we find out that we're not those beautiful models <laughs> with the, that perfect smooth skin and those idealized bodies, but that we actually live in the real world. Perfect skin, idealised bodies and unhappy lives, perhaps. Mm. I don't know. Can we, can we give Peter Reiner a really big thank, thank you? Because it is... We're very grateful, Peter, for your time. It is getting on for probably 2 a.m. or 2.30 a.m. and you are busting to go to the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for being with us from Canada there in Vancouver. We've, we're very grateful. Thank you. And to Shane Moon, Dr Shane Moon, thank you. Thank you. My all the way from sunny Melbourne and also all the way from sunny Melbourne uh, to Phil Harris. Thank you, Dr Phil Thanks, Harris. Thank you. Thank you. And to all of you from sunny Adelaide, thank you very much for being here. Now, next Wednesday is the last in the series, the RI Oz series, The Seven Deadly Sins. It's taking on sloth. Fantastic. Hope you're there. I think it's the book club night, isn't it? Also, we have um, questionnaires. This, this sort of stuff, this piece of paper, it's a bit of marketing, I guess, um, is what keeps in institutions like this alive. We urge you to fill it out so that you get the best events you possibly can. And thank you very much. Um, bits of this will be pulled together to be broadcast on All in the Mind on Radio National this Saturday, repeated on Monday at 1. Enjoy, have a lovely night, enjoy your dinner. Thank you. <laughs>